everyone, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we see people from all over the world who's joining us today for, on this online lecture uh, hosted by Mashav and MCTC. Mashav is Israel's Agency for International Development. And um, we're here to discuss a very important topic on how to protect women from domestic violence during the coronavirus crisis. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us around the world. Before we start, I just would like to say uh, a few logistics. Your microphones and your videos have been turned off for security reasons. So if you have any questions or you have any comments, please feel free to write them in the chat. And we will uh, try to address as many questions as we can at the end of the lecture. So I would like to introduce now our lecturer. Uh, Ms. Ronit Levary, which everyone can see. Uh, Ronit Levary is a criminologist and an expert on the prevention of violence against women. She is a pioneer and trailblazer in the field of violence against women and girls in Israel. She served as the Israeli government's foremost authority on women's issues under two prime ministers and is a recognized leader in the field of gender-based violence. She is a founding staff member of Beit Rut, she leads its advocacy and outreach initiative that is designed to help raise awareness and understanding among like-minded stakeholders about the pandemic issue of violence and abuse. So before we start, uh, Ronit would like to share with you a short movie about Beit Ruth. Okay. 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 Hi everyone, I'm very excited and I thank you for joining me. And uh, I want to say that it's my first webinar in life, so <laughs> I am really excited. And uh, I want to thank you, staff of Mashav, that are suppo so supportive. Young girls who have been victims of violence and abuse and the phenomenon of violence against women in the family. Most of the girls of Betwood have been abused sexually, physically, and emotionally they arrived, they arrived at the age of 13 years old. What happened to them as children has a great influence, has a great influence over their lives now and in their future. Some lived as little girls for months with their mothers in a shelter for battered women and children. They remember picture, pictures of blood on the walls in their homes. This is all part of their lives, part of their childhood memories. This, this is what they will bring to their adult lives if they don't receive help. Violent, violence against women in the family is an, an universal phenomenon, phenomenon which has got public attention only since 1971 when the first shelter for bettered women was established by a small group of radical feminists in England. Nowadays, most societies believe that it is not anymore, it is not anymore a women's issue, but a social problem. Most bettered women are mothers. Part of these children are abused directly Sometimes they are only witness to the violence against their mothers, which also has a great influence on them. Violence against women in the family is the most hidden crime in the world. Mm -hmm. It happens only between walls. Most violent par partners are abusive only at home. Since the coronavirus crisis began, the number of women calling support services has more than doubled in Israel, like in many other countries all over the world. It is important to note that all this has been happening while police and social departments are understaffed. The home became the most dangerous place for women and children. Fear and economic pressure greatly increase violent behavior. For many years now, we have witnessed the fact that violent partners can be highly educated, educated in a very 
and in a very good economic position. At the same time, battered women are also part of all levels of society. Most of the cases are hidden. Only a low, a low percentage of the women complain. Most violent spouses are polite and gentle at work, among, fr among friends and with their neighbors. Nine million people live in Israel. The assumption is that we have between 400,000 and 500,000 battered women. Most of them are not reported. At this point, I wish to share with you the model of the first center for treating and preventing violence in the family, which I developed in 1983 in Israel. This project was implemented in AMAT, a big women Israeli organization. As for today, 118 such centers are, uh, for treating and preventing domestic violence are fully active all over the country, financed and regulated by the Welfare Ministry. On the 80th of March, 1983, we opened the first center in Israel on, on the very day we got almost 90 calls. Also, it was published as a line for domestic violence, only women called, their age ranging from 17 to 80. All of them shared the same story. Quote, we became, he became physically abused only after we got married or after I got pregnant. He's controlling me. I am isolated. I have no friends anymore. Uh, the bank account is only on his name. He gives me cash money every day, controlling my expenses. Most weekends we spend alone or with his family. He is very jealous, overprotective, and possessive. After being, being violent, he apologizes and sometimes brings the present. The children witness everything. I never went to the police. I am ashamed and I am also afraid that it will become worse. When I ask him to join me to marriage counseling, he says that he should get therapy because I am crazy. If I offer him to divorce, he tells me to leave the house, but insists that the children remain with him." Unquote. Some of the women asked me to call their husbands. I did so. All of them came to meet me. I did not blame them, only trying to speak about the quality of their life. But after this meeting, they never came back and prevented their wife from returning to the center. If we try to understand the violent man's behavior, we can almost justify it. If after he beats, his wife accepts his apology and even blames herself and promises not to make him angry again, why should he have any motivation to change his behavior? Women describe their partners as an angel and a devil. Sometimes you feel in Garden of Eden and sometimes in hell. They describe the husbands as black and white persons. In general, he's a good person, but sometimes he gets crazy and loses his control, loses control. Policemen would testify that they never saw a broken television because, you know, they know they want to see their sport, sport programs, which is, which is clear proof that these men can control their behavior. Most of them are normal and therefore they are violent only at home in a place that keeps their good name and honor. honor. The huge paradox, which is shown by data again and again, is that most better women bring to their relationship more resources than their partners, than their partner. They are more educated, more stable at work if they are allowed to work. They have more life skills and they are more verbal. The husband feels inferior and from the very beginning, he is afraid to lose his woman. The 
way for him to be confident is to take her more and more dependent on him. In the extreme cases, he feels as if she is an integral part of his body and soul. The, character, the characteristic of the women behavior is to accept, to forgive, to understand, hoping that this, that things will, will improve in the future. At this stage, we understood that we should find a way to empower women emotionally, economically, and socially in order to make her strong enough to understand that he needs her more than she needs him, to help her to believe that she deserves to have a peaceful life. In the years 1983-2000, we as staff, which included counselors, lawyers, and therapists, met th thousands of couples. In the very beginning, we understood that the wife decision to leave the violent partner puts her in a very high risk pos position. The first professional meeting with the woman started with a diagnosis which included her emotional, social, and economic, economic situation and an answer to the question if she is ready to take any, any action. The most important part of this first meeting is the evaluation of her immediate or future risk. If the woman shows any signs of ambivalence about taking any steps, think, think that which happens very often, she was offered to join a support group of women in the same situation. If she was evaluated in a high risk situation and she was ready to live, uh, live with her children, she was accepted by a shelter for far away from her, ho her home. The welfare department used to contact the husband that was left alone at home and offered him to join, to join treatment. In Israel, there are 14 shelters which protect battered women and children. Among these, there are two shelters for Arab women and two for Jewish Orthodox women. These shelters are fully financed and regulated by the government. The first shelter in Israel was established by a feminist activist group and financed by donations. Going back to the center, we found very soon that the violent partners agree to communicate only after they realize that they have lost something they need and love. They cooperate only when they lost something that they needed, hoping to get their wife back. Men participate with therapy also after being arrested, wanting to show the judge that they stop their violent behavior and got alternative ways to, expre to express their frustra frustration, hoping to get a, lo a lower punishment. Before starting therapy, a lawyer prepare, prepares a peace control, a peace contract, in which the men and the, the men and the women obligated to start therapy joining a woman group and the main group wishing for peaceful life. It is, it is, it is, if it did, didn't work, the agreement was changed to a divorce agreement. Most murders happen when the obsessive partner is with his wife when he realized, realized that she is about to leave him. Sometimes he was never physically abusive, but he was was from the very beginning very controlling and possessive. A man in this extreme emotional situation can be very dangerous toward his wife, his children, and toward, toward himself. His separation and anxiety can be very extreme and destructive. The main purpose of this model is to help women, children, and men to stay alive. To stay alive as a couple or as individuals 
without any terror and fear. Data from 2018 show that 6,488 women and 2,478 men were treated in the center all over the country. 682 women were in shelters with 1,011 children. Between 2004 till 2018, 163 women were murdered in Israel, most of, most of them by partners who didn't accept their decision to leave them. The coronavirus crisis challenges us to be creative. The present situation in which the shelters are full and the family or, or origin and the family of origin is unable to help because of the lockdown order challenges us to think about alternative ways to act. Talking about possessive partners, these days are pe perfect day for them because their wives do not have any options, many options as to where to go. In fact, they, that calms them down. I have some recommendations for women, some expectations from the near community and, and neighbors and some demands from the authorities. I call on, I call on women, please don't plan divorce in these days when you are stuck at home with no option to be in a safe place during the divorce process. It can be very dangerous. If you suffer from physical abuse, if he is breaking things and screaming, open the windows, stop hiding, stop being ashamed. If you are even at a short time alone at home, call a hotline to get support and, adv and advice and advice. From the new community, we should expect solidarity, sensitivity. The neighbor, neighbors should call the police immediately if they hear women or children screaming. What we should be, what we should we expect from the police? In Israel, in Israel after a long process, uh, we have a professional unit for domestic violence in, very, in every police station. Many years ago, policemen were functioning as family counselors. For the last 20 years, violent men have been arrested, face criminal charges in court and are removed from homes. Nowadays, the issue of domestic violence should get very high prior priority by the police. They should react very fast to every call for help, they, for help they are getting. The Ministry of Welfare should create new temporary places for violent men who are removed from home. Places like that will encourage the police to act immediately and effectively. We must bear in mind that violence is an outcome of frustration. In Israel, local authorities, in association with volunteer organizations, respond important needs like supplying computers to children who are studying now from home long distance, especially computer, especially, uh, especially uh, they need computer. The family that need computer, especially are these they have that have more children than computers at home. High, high tech com companies try hired services from small enterprises in purpose to de decompress economic pressure. All of us should think about more variety ideas, uh, ideas to relieve the economic and emotional pressure the families are in. In general, we should be more sensitive and feel empathy and solidarity to each other. We began with a video about the Bedworth village to show the connection between young girls and young girls who are abused and how this experience increases the risk of being abused 
as an adult. But what we village, Betwood Village was established in order to break this cycle. If young girls who have been abused are open to strong and assertive role models and are treated, treated in a gender sensitive way, they can develop skills, increase their self esteem, and learn how to become healthy adults who do accept abuse as part of other of their lives. With the right kind of interventions, what happens to them in the past does not have to continue in the future. Men who have abused, men who abuse, were abused as children. Women who are abused, many of them were abused as little girls and as teenagers. The way each gender responds to abuse is different, especially after the age of 12 or 13. Most boys' reaction is to act out and to become aggressive. They hurt people and they destroy property. They demand to be heard. Most of the girls act in, they hurt themselves, and they continue living with a violent partner as a way of as a way to continue self-destruction. They believe they deserve to be harmed. We see, we see proof of how destructive violence can be, not just to those who are being abused, but to all of society. The extreme example are people like Hitler, Stalin, or Saddam Hussein. They all had terrible childhood. They were abused as children extremely. They all became monsters. This doesn't mean all children who were abused will become monsters, but they will all become victims of their abuse. The ways the children used survive, survive the abuse are destructive ways to act and to live as adults. At Betwood, girls live with us for up to four years. We see a parallel process between the treatment she receives and how she changes. As girls become stronger, their self-esteem increases. They make health, healthier, healthier choices. We see this with our own eyes. If a girl has a boyfriend, he is invited to meet the staff. We see a relationship that is a real partnership. We don't see the boyfriend trying to control her or to create dependency on him. We don't see these kinds of warning signs, these signs that we are teaching our girls to recognize. We believe that boys too deserve a sensitive gender education in which they will get full legitimation to express their emotions in a constructive way. The mission of Betwood is to break generational violence. We give the girls an education, we empower them, we help them make positive choices about their lives. All of this gives them the, the tools to break the cycle of violence when they have their own children. One of our graduates who is happily married and works in an emergency room as a nurse told me, while I'm grateful and proud of my achievements, what I'm, I'm most thankful for is breaking the cycle of generational abuse so my three daughters will never have known, will never will never have to know a life of fear, harm. Instead, they will know only a loving family. Uh, this is the end of my um, lecture and I, I would like to answer questions or to add some, something that you would, you would me to add. Thank you, thank you very much, Ronit. Uh, there are 
there are a few questions in the chat that have uh, come up. So I will uh, read, read one and let you answer. Um, from uh, Nilar, um, the question is, do you have some guideline to discuss with the perpetrators? And what do you do with the perpetrators? Uh, as I explained, the perpetrators are coping only when they feel that they lose something. So um, when I used to meet them, and I'm not a therapist, I did only the diagnosis, the first diagnosis, um, I met them and, and at that point, uh, after he got, it was punishment, he, for me, he was too a victim because most of them were abused children, their self-esteem is very low, they were very stressed when they come. So one was to support him and to offer a legal advice and therapy. The most uh, effective therapy that I can say was in our experience was group therapy. Men are not they are not used to look for therapy. They are somehow um, uh, forced to come by court or by the situation. And once they are joining a group of men, and I think that the better way is men treating men. When he when he joins the group, he doesn't want, he doesn't want to leave because he gets support. He makes he becomes he has new friends and he feels that he has the full legitimation to talk about what he sometimes never talked about. I hope that I gave some. Okay, direction. thank you very much. Um, another question that we have from Carolyn. Um, do you help the children of the affected families on how to deal with the stress? How do you do it? Yes, um, one of the cases that, that I remember was a woman coming to the shelter because the, the, after during the almost 20 years that I, I was directing the department that started with one center, became four centers. Afterwards, we established a shelter for better women and children. She came to us. She was directed by the welfare, welfare department from Jerusalem. She came to Tel Aviv. And she told us that for one year, her son is treated by a psychologist while being a witness for everyday uh, attacks. And I told her that it's like to, to put a someone under a, boy, a, a very hot water shower and put on his head, head an umbrella, but the umbrella has holes. And therefore I should take him out because you know, it, it was so funny to hear about it. And I believe that uh, working with the children is at first working with the mother and the father and, uh, and stop, stopping the violence. Afterwards, of course, the children uh, should be to, uh, get therapy and uh, what we are doing in bad water actually is uh, to, to treat the girls, to support them. And what we found that even if there were only witnesses of violence, they are very, very hurt and they need a very deep therapy and a special education. And uh, I should say that arts, is something that is healing and very, very uh, effective. Uh, drawings, music, and all area of art, art that give some extreme emotions that they are used to. Okay, thank you, Anit. Um, there's uh, another question. Um, do the children in an, in an abusive marriage have anger towards the mother from never leaving the abusive husband? Yeah, the story of the children is very, very complicated. There is a period, period 
that they are with the mother against the father. It can happen after some years that they are with the father against the mother. It can be explained but by the dissonance that these children are living in because in one hand they feel unconfident and they in one hand they want to support and protect the mother in the other hand sometimes they feel pity for the father there are some that feel that father can protect them so it's very very complicated we had a case in israel that the son mur uh, murdered the father after he was very very uh, violent and uh, I can say that this young man really destroyed his life because he felt very, it, till today he feels very guilty about what he did. So there are, uh, sometimes they are angry, sometimes they don't want the mother, the mother to leave the house. It's, we have various uh, ways of behavior, children. Okay, we have a question from uh, Rajib from India, who says, um, uh, what is your view about the relationship between domestic violence and economic class? Is it true this happens mostly with poor and middle class families? You know, I always uh, want us to imagine a bus with 70 people without con air condition, in a hot place like India and Israel, and a bus with seven people with an air condition. We know that there is connection between, you know, ecolog um, ecological uh, situation and violence, of course. Economic. And economic, uh, economic uh, situation, of course, this the economic pressure can put out frustration. Uh, there is connection. I always say that uh, if a very educated and ri rich man is violent, uh, I would say that it's more directed to a psychiatrist, psychiat for the psychiatrist to solve. Uh, there is connection. We cannot uh, say that uh, there is no connection, but I met women that were really from all over the kinds of society. Yes. Okay. There's a few questions that are asking the same type of question. So I, I will read them all out loud and maybe you can um, sort of look at all of them. Um, how long after the abuse do you recommend victims to receive Psycho psychological therapy. Um, so that's one. And then another one about tackling the problem of taking care of underage girls. And um, how do you, do you have guidelines for how to help children who have who have been uh, who have seen the abuse and has been that has been going on at home? Uh, if you can repeat the first the first question about therapy? The first question was about how long should you wait until they start to re receiving therapy after the abuse? They have not to wait. It, it, it happens immediately. If they go to the Center for Preventing and uh, Treating Violence in the Family, they get the treatment immediately. Uh, this, I hope that it continues like that. We insisted that it has to happen immediately and we when we had a group that we had 12 14 women we opened another group we didn't let her to wait as well the husbands that if they were agreed to come they were accepted immediately okay okay if you can the second yeah yeah the second question was how, how are, do you have guidelines on how to help uh, girls who are underage and children who have been uh, either have seen violence or have been part of, of the violence? Uh, of course, this uh, long, you know, it, it depends on the age. If they are little children, uh, the most effective 
way is to observe uh, al alternatives, observe, observe other kinds of behavior. Because being a witness to violence, you, you adopt this behavior. So therapy, you know, sometimes I think about therapy, it's one hour a week. But uh, under 12, under 13, I would put most of the, you know, responsibility on the parents because they are the models and they have to, to change and to give another, another uh, way of uh, behavior to give the alternatives. Okay. Um, so there's a question here about communities who, who don't have shelters. Um, how can you suggest uh, alternative ways to help women in communities where there are no shelters? available? If I think about the, how shelters um, were established in many, many places, it was really uh, something that uh, citizens started to do. You know, it, it, I cannot imagine a country without a shelter. It's really very complicated. I don't see any alternative. Sometimes uh, we have a organization that is running two shelters for Orthodox women. And it started with the men. And I, I want to say that there are men that are with us, uh, you know, fight, fighting the phenomenon of uh, better women. It's not only a women issue. And he was, he is very religious. And he, he was walking in the street at night and he met in a very orthodox environment, a woman with a little baby. And she told him that she ran away from a very violent husband. And he arranged a little apartment. He, he bought, he got money from, you know, got donations, started with a little apartment. And he understood that there is a big problem even between very orthodox uh, people and he started building it and, you know, uh, advancing his idea. And now he has, the, this organization has two shelters for women and children financed by, by the government. And I don't have any, any uh, idea how to make it in another way. It's a, it has to be, uh, it has to be, you know, done by the grassroots, by activity, active women and men today. I, I really hope that men join everywhere to help and to create something that is so needed. Okay. Um, there is a question about um, verbal and emotional abuse. So what kind of preventive messages, what kind of preventive measures do we need to use when people are, you, are used to verbally abuse their, par their partners and not physically? And what kind of legal actions are there for verbal and emotional abuse? And if you can give an example or two, if you have any cases. I would like to uh, divide two phenomena. One is these men that are not physically abuse, abusive, but they are controlling, jealous, uh, obsessive. These are very, very dangerous men, as I said. In the other end, only, you know, it's not only, it's not nice to live with someone that, uh, you know, is screaming or uh, telling how, you know, he telling you really bad things that, can be can hurt you. This is another story. Uh, I would say that it is just the same. If um, someone is uh, verbal abusive and the partner is not reacting, it wouldn't change. And somehow, I think that we shouldn't wait the police to you know to build our lives. It, it's not easy to do, but I believe that to live, to put energy uh, uh, in this marriage, this so bad marriage, marriages, 
it's, it's such a high level of energy that women need, if they would take this energy and even work in three places, they will have a wonderful life. And the question is not what, how to treat it and uh, what to look for, but to, to be strong and to put limits to this behavior. And if it doesn't stop, you know, she has to live, but to live carefully because I want her to stay alive. Okay. And what about if a man an who is uh, a husband who is abusive, he refuses to go for counseling? What would be your suggestion? This is most of the cases. I said, uh, I said it in the beginning. Most of the cases, if, he, if she asks him, because she wants to solve things in democratic ways. He doesn't know them, democracy. He knows dictatorship. This was his education. There is no dialogue. There is no dialogue. Most of the women say, I want to finish it nicely. I always say that you cannot talk with Japanese uh, Spanish, for example. They wouldn't understand. With Japanese, you have to be to talk Japanese, okay? It's, it's sometimes sad to say, but if he doesn't go, because he, you know, everything is okay. He's uh, screaming, he's uh, breaking, and afterwards, you know, he can be very quiet. And she is blaming herself, and she's, she apologizes. So only if, and men are not socialized to get help. And this is some of our uh, challenges, to change boys' education, to give them legitimation to talk about their emotions to make a therapy legitimate, legitimate for men too. But for nowadays, in most of the places, in most of the societies, only if she will put limits, he will agree to get some help. So in connection to that question, there are a few questions about uh, what do you do if the woman doesn't want to aggravate the situation and you don't want to, so she doesn't want help because she thinks it will aggravate the situation. Um, and how can we help women in communities when they are not ready to speak out uh, about what they are going through because it's against their culture? Yes, at that point, I want to talk about the children. If, and it happened to me sometimes that women, the women called, called, phone call, and she didn't want to, to do anything, even not to join a support group. Uh, and we always told her that uh, we don't, we, we, are go we are not going to tell anyone what happens. But if, she, if the environment feels that there is a high level of violence in the family, and she doesn't want to speak out, uh, I would say, I would tell her that we have to, to announce the, depart, the welfare department about the children because these children are at risk. And uh, in my experience, when I told the woman that I, by law, and in Israel, by law, we are forced to announce and to, to talk, to give the information to the welfare office, if she wouldn't cope, uh, I have to do it, she would cope. So sometimes we have to be very sensitive to make it very slow, but she has to know that the right of the children is to live in a peaceful ho home. That's it. Okay, so this is a question that has um, repeated itself, and, and I know you spoke about it in the lecture, but um, maybe you can... Um, say it again. What are the specific recommendations you have to prevent domestic violence during this coronavirus COVID-19 isolation period? Okay. Uh, the one is the fact that if, uh, as I said, uh, deciding to live, deciding to divorce, uh, puts 
the, the, the woman in a very high risk position. And in most of the cases, when she comes to get counseling, she will offer to leave the house. Now, she cannot leave the house. This is the point. So I say that if it is possible, uh, she has to wait with her program to divorce. And only we should treat the present violent behavior by in the in, in usual day in usual time I prefer her to live and I prefer him to stay at home. And some sometimes I hear that people say, you know, it's it's not justice, it's not fair. She has to stay and he has to live. And it's very sad to say, but I, I know some women that insisted to stay and they were murdered. So I say always, be, don't f look for justice. Be, be clever and live. He's the weak one. Leave him at home. But now when the shelters are full or there are not shelters and she is stuck at home, I say that we have to treat a specific the physical violence and therefore I, I talk about the, the neighbors and the police, policemen, and I talk with a, in a high position professional person in the welfare office and they agree that we should have a places for men that, you know, we have, if we have an extre extreme case of violence, he would go to jail, he will be arrested. But the cases that are not very extreme, it can be removed from the house. And now where is going, where, where is going to be? He cannot go to his parents because he has old parents and they cannot accept, accept him now. So we need extra places for these men to stay there and perhaps to study something new to behave. Uh, the community should be more sensitive, more, we should find more solidarity to, to make the stress lower, low, because this is something that we talk about prevention, to prevent the stress, to see how much we can help these families to lower the stress, because frustration is the base of violence we, we, we experience. Okay, Ronit, can you, I think we have time for maybe one or maybe two more questions. Um, there's been a question about uh, introducing programs in schools. Yeah. Um, could you talk uh, a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, I would like to talk about it. Um, after some uh, meetings with the uh, women many, many years ago, I found that it didn't start at, uh, when they became, after the wedding, but there were behaviors that uh, we called red lights, red lights that can predict possibility of physical violence afterwards when he feels very confident in the relationship. Physical uh, behavior will appear after he feels confident after they are married or she's pregnant or she, they have a baby. Before it, he has to be careful, but the behavior that we teach, and it is part of the in school studying today, not all of the all schools, because in Bedwood, it, it is very strong and the girls know, you know, one of the girls can say, you know, I left him because he's very possessive, he's very jealous. Is uh, telling me what uh, to, to put on myself, what to clo which clothes I need. He doesn't like my friend. He doesn't may like me to go to have some, uh, you know, uh, uh, to go with my uh, girl, a good friend of mine, uh, even to talk with my friend. So, if he's jealous, if he's controlling, if he blames her on in every argument they have. Uh, if she feels isolated, and it, it is a process because this behavior seems to be very positive. Uh, it's, it, it can say, if you love me, um, cut connections with your friends. If you love me, don't go to the army, you know, in Israel at 18, all, all the youths are going to, to the army. Don't go to the army. Don't make national service. 
uh, be only with me. Uh, he dictates how she has to, uh, which clothes she has to wear. All these signs that can seem as love and attention uh, become more and more, you know, uh, tied. And the other part is that she is somehow like a little social worker for him because he was abused and he tells her what happened to him at the, as a child and she feels pity. This is something that we can say that most of the women have this side of uh, being a psychologist, a social worker of your partner and trying to change him. And uh, I always uh, think about the legend of the um, princess and the frog, that the princess dreams to kiss the frog because she wishes him to be a prince. And in our cases, the princess herself becomes a frog and they're sitting in the little, you know, water together. He, because she, she, she hopes to change him to a prince, but she becomes a frog afterwards. And uh, we really are doing a lot of work with the young the soldiers, pupils, and we should work with the, with the boys too, not only with the girls, but apart, apart. The girls should be together and the boys, and the boys need two good role models of men that show their feelings, they don't think that to, to be a man, you have to be a macho. This is a very, very important thing. Okay, mm -hmm. Ronit, um, our time is up. I will leave you, maybe if you have any last uh, comments you would like to say before we say goodbye to everyone. Okay, Sarah, I want to, to thank you, to thank Yuda, to thank all the staff of Mashav Havakari, the director. It was a very, very interesting experience. You know, my English, it, it's not my mother language, you know. My children talk better with a better accent, but I try my best and I hope that I was understood and I add something to all the wonderful audience that uh, joined us. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much to you as well for joining us and uh, for giving us some insight into this very important topic that uh, is very important uh, all over the world, not just here in Israel. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. And we hope to see you at the next one. Only one sentence. Everyone is invited to Beth Ruth in Israel. We, shall, we really like, like guests. So we wish you in Israel to see our wonderful village. That's great. That's wonderful to hear. Actually, there was a few questions about if you take uh, volunteers. So yeah, if they have any questions, they should yeah. look on the website. Yeah, then... yeah, yeah. Of course, we have wonderful volunteers.